food bank use is at an all-time high. Last year, food banks in the Trussell Trust network gave out nearly 3 million emergency food parcels to people facing hardship. That's a 37% rise compared to the year before. So are we witnessing a dependency away from the welfare state and moving towards third sectors such as Trussell Trust filling the gap? Are we therefore seeing the role of the state shrinking as time goes on? Welcome to Debt Talk Podcast with me, your host, Ripon Ray. I'm going to talk to you about welfare state, deficit budget and debt in this month's episode with my panellists. To navigate such a delicate and sensitive topic, I have Helen Barnard, Policy Director of Trussell Trust, a charity which supports food banks and campaigns to end the need for food banks across the UK. Rachel Gregory, Christian Against Poverty's Senior External Affairs Manager. Christian Against Poverty published a report taking on UK poverty last month. Shall be talking about unsustainable budgets for many of their clients who are in debt. And finally, I will hear from Amy Taylor, a debt advisor and chair of the Greater Manchester Money Advice Group. Through interaction with clients, she can tell us what it means by unsustainable clients with budget problems. My on top tips to my listeners near the end of the podcast. For those listening to Debt Talk and want to share your specific experience or want to hear a specific subject, get in touch with me, ripon.ray at yourdoctordebt.com, otherwise Twitter, your doctor debt. So let me first get Helen Barnard into the conversation since her organization, Trust or Trust, provides food when communities are struggling because the current welfare state is not meeting the needs the state initially designed to do. Helen, before we got to the current situation, let us go back to history to understand the real cause of the creation of a welfare state in the first place. Could you tell us how it was developed and what was the underlying cause of the creation of such a welfare state that we know today? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. So last year was the 80th anniversary of the Beveridge Report. Now, this was by William Beveridge. It was basically a big report that laid the underpinning for our modern welfare state. So social security and national health service, education, all these things which we now think of as part of the kind of fabric of society. Now, that happened. It was straight after the Second World War. If you go back before that, what you essentially had was a kind of patchwork across the country. So you had local authorities doing some help, you had churches, you had charities, but there was nothing consistent. And the help you could get was entirely dependent on where you happened to be, who you asked, whether you were thought of as deserving or meeting criteria for any given little local organisation. What we then had was after the Second World War, There was actually a real drive to say we've been through this national trauma. We have had all these people who have kind of given up everything for the country. And actually, we should create a it was that phrase, a land fit for heroes. So the idea that all these soldiers are coming back from the war, all of their families have kind of kept the home fires burning and we should do better than we did before. We shouldn't let people go back to the kind of destitution which a lot of people would end up in. So we saw the creation of the welfare state. So the idea that all of us, when times get tough, we can, as of right, draw on support, which we as a nation have set up and paid into. And it doesn't depend on luck and it doesn't depend on where you are. And you aren't having to go to strangers and kind of ask for their kindness just to kind of get back on your feet. So that's where we used to be. That's what the welfare state was intended to do. But I think you're right. What we're seeing now is that the social security bit of that welfare state is no longer providing that reliable safety net, which is what we should all be able to turn to.
But when, let's say, individuals or households coming in and knocking on the doorsteps of Trussell Trust and their networks, when you ask them questions around what is the cause of you being in a financial hardship, what sort of responses are you getting? When you look at, you know, who is it that ends up having to turn to food banks? I mean, the first thing to say is that people overwhelmingly put it off as long as they can. It is a, such a last resort. So what you tend to find when people come to a food bank, they are generally in debt. They generally have lots of different kinds of debt. They have very often borrowed from family and friends. They've kind of exhausted all those other resources and they've just been left with nowhere to turn. And there are particular groups of people who are disproportionately ending up in that situation. So the majority of people who end up at food banks are disabled and those who aren't tend to live with someone who is. Um, most people are getting a means tested benefit of some kind, particularly universal credit. Um, but often you have, there are two things going on. One is that accessing benefits, particularly disability benefits, um, can be incredibly difficult and complicated and take a long time. So if you, you can see that in, uh, so our financial inclusion advisors, helping people with personal independence payments applications is one of the biggest things. That's also the biggest uh, benefits advice topic for systems advice for the joint helpline we run. So there's difficulty accessing benefits. There's difficulty managing debt, and it's particularly actually debt to the state. Um, so it's debt to DWP or council tax. It's those kinds of debt. But the third thing is even when you give people great financial advice, which most of our food banks now do, and you get them everything they're entitled to, the sheer level of benefits now has been allowed to erode so far that if you, it is no longer enough to even cover the essentials. So we did some work with the Joseph Browntree Foundation to say, well, how much do you need a week to cover the essentials? Just kind of food, basic household items, bills. We found for a single person living on their own, they need 120 pounds a week to cover those costs, just the basics. Universal credit is 85 pounds a week. So every single week, people are 35 pounds short of what they need. So of course, people end up in debt and cold and hungry and scared and health conditions get worse. Um, and then on top of that, you've got issues around insecure jobs particularly. So it's income from social security is just too low because there's no connection in the system between how much essentials cost and how much you get. And then when people are trying to get into work, either it's hard to find accessible jobs if you're disabled or the childcare or the transport, or even if you are in work, it's not just low paid, it's insecure. So you're not getting a steady income you can rely on. So those are the issues that we find leave people in this situation where they've just got nowhere else to turn. You mentioned briefly about um, the amount of money an individual need. It takes me towards universal basic income. Now, what is your thought on the actual concept and what are the challenges in implementing such a concept into reality? So I think with universal basic income, I mean, it's worth saying there is no one thing that is universal basic income. There are lots of versions of it that have pros and cons. Um, I think fundamentally people who are advocating for UBI, as it's sometimes referred to, um, they, are, they have identified genuine problems in the current system. And this feels like a very simple way to solve them. So the problems that people don't always get access to the benefits they should have, that you have to jump through lots of hoops. It can feel like a very undignified process. For some people, it can actually be quite traumatic, uh, some of the interactions people have with the social security system. And it feels like it should be really simple. Let's just give everyone some money. You know, we'll solve all the problems. Um, but I actually think, I think two things. One is that all the models I've seen of universal basic income systems are significantly more expensive than the current system even if you don't actually raise benefits very much which so you wouldn't really address poverty that much but you just kind of do it on a more universalist basis you are still talking about billions of pounds a year to do that the second thing is introducing whole new systems is an absolute nightmare you think about how universal credit has been and how difficult it has been for everybody involved to get this new system in place the idea that what we need to do is you know, chuck it all away and create yet another new system. That is a massive risk to take. And my feeling is that there is so much you could do. If you, if you philosophically believe a universal basic income approach is the best approach, there is a massive amount you can do in the current system 
to introduce that. So we could roll back the whole conditionality sanctions regime. It didn't used to be the way it is now. People didn't used to get financial penalties if they missed an appointment. You can roll all that back. You can make it much more supportive. You can make it use the universal bits. Child benefit, for instance, used to be completely universal and now they tax it for higher earners. Now that may or may not be a good idea, but if, you, you know, if you're a fan of universalism, then let's do more with child benefit, put more money through it. You can raise all the caps. You can get rid of the two child limit. Um, you can not reassess people so often so that there's, it's steadier. There's an enormous amount you can do in the current system without either the massive expense of a new UBI system or the disruption it would cause to try and do something like that. When I think you could achieve most of the goals by just running the current system in a more compassionate and effective way. And how about also if one argues that it may also impact government's own balance sheet, because obviously to run something like this costs a huge deal of money, would there be an appetite for a change from either mainstream political parties? So I think, so yes, of course, money, it would be much more expensive. Some of the things that I want to do in the current system are also quite expensive, to be fair. So either way, we need to win an argument with the public that this is a good use of money and pro- and that they are happy for their tax, you know, their tax pounds to go towards it. Now, I think for me, the polling I've seen, there is a kind of significant minority of the public who quite like the UBI idea and would be up for it. It's not a majority. So if the exam question is, how do we get more money going into the system so it's more adequate? I am not convinced that you win that public argument more easily by saying, let's just give it to everybody with no conditions, rather than saying, we want to make what we're giving to people who have been assessed as really needing it actually adequate for the basics of life. So I think there is that kind of, we we need to win the argument on money. I'm not convinced UBI helps us win that argument. Thank you, Helen. Let me get Rachel Gregory on behalf of Christian Against Poverty onto this precise subject. Rachel, what is your thought on um, universal basic income? Hi, Ruffin. It's great to be with you. Um, I think, Helen, you, you expressed really like thoughtful consideration of um, universal basic income. I think it's very clear that it's not going to be a silver bullet, that there needs to be real thought put into what is the best approach to tackling poverty. I would say we're really interested as in it as an idea and um, it's really topical at the moment. I'm noticing it even in some of the discussions about AI and the impact that's going to have on jobs that perhaps we need to be thinking about it for the future Um, and uh, there's just been a new trial launch of universal basic income and it's very small I think it's about 20 people involved but you know we'll be watching with interest and and I think it sort of summarizes some of the the sort of type of ambitious ideas that we do want to see to actually be taking poverty seriously and thinking about what are our routes to really making a big sea change in it but I think um, yes as Helen says there's much more that we need to complement it that can be done urgently because we've got a real problem now and I think that's where actually the um, essentials guarantee campaign that Helen was speaking about and we've supported um, being run by Trussell Trust and JRS um, is an example of what you can do now to tackle deep poverty but we have to keep thinking about how do we tackle poverty you know overall for the 14 million people facing it in the UK because that's not a future we want to see in the short or the long term. When you recently published a report taking on UK poverty I mean where does your report what are your findings so far? Yeah so our report taking on UK poverty um, is actually an annual report that we do each year that explores our clients experiences so particularly the people we're supporting with debt and what we're trying to really draw out in this year's report that as you say is called taking on UK poverty is actually we're not really dealing with debt at the moment we are dealing with poverty and debt is a symptom of that Um, our report had lots of um, different statistics that we were drawing out about how hard things are getting for people just being able to afford the basics so like Helen's expressed you know that scene at the food banks of people struggling to afford food Um, we are seeing more and more people coming to us with arrears on council tax and rent and water you know it's across the board it's across people's living expenses and also the wider impact that has on people in their lives the the scale of mental health challenges and hopelessness that we're dealing with at the moment is really shocking and scary one of the um 
key findings in our report this year was that one in two of the people coming to us for help are telling us that they considered taking their own life because of debt. They felt that might be their only way out. And that's made a big jump up in the last year, um, which we're really, really concerned about. And for us at CAP, we um, really want to be seeing people's lives transformed in the here and now. But it's really important to us that we're talking about um, tackling poverty because otherwise we're just helping people out of debt now, but more and more people are falling into that trap again. Um, and so as an organisation, we we see our role as um, working to equip and inspire the UK church to play an active part of that as you know one player on the pitch that we need to be involved in tackling poverty across society. So we're providing um, expert debt advice as well as community groups supporting people trying to find work um, or with money coaching and um, making sure people are claiming as much income as they can from the social security system and um, but yeah also really importantly speaking up about what we're seeing helping people express their own experiences of poverty and so we can be part of campaigning to see that change made on a national scale as well as the individuals that we're able to support through our services directly. In your report you repeatedly mention unsustainable budget of clients could you please expand on that what does that actually mean? Yeah, sure. So it, it's something that as a whole sector has been talked about more and more and often different phrases are used. Sometimes we talk about negative budgets or deficit budgets. In our report, we talk about unsustainable budgets where we sort of what we're looking at is when our debt advisors have sat down with someone, looked at their budget, what they've got coming in, what they need to spend, talked about any opportunities that they've got to reduce their expenditure or perhaps whether they need to increase it a bit because they've been really sacrificing you know essentials that they do actually need what is the money someone needs um, to afford the basics and also live sustainably on a budget for a period of time because often we're talking to people about how they're going to repay their debts over several years so we have to be realistic about is it a budget people are going to be able to live on um, and what we're finding is increasingly um, our advisors are assessing that people don't have that income that's going to allow them to live sustainably on that budget and actually we've seen that number rising every single year in the last five years except for in 2020 2021 where there was more support put into social security during the pandemic and um, with the 20 pounds per week uplift which I think is really key and harks back to what Helen started talking to us about about how powerful the social security system is as a lever to help people um, escape poverty. You clearly mentioned that you campaign against poverty and written many reports, annual reports, um, including the one that we've just mentioned. But to what extent those reports are genuinely making an impact in current times? many charities have recently faced uh, challenging issues i.e in the context of making their staff redundant and funding crisis we are seeing the reduction in the whole what is your thought on this yeah so we we definitely have been impacted by like you say the sort of sector-wise challenges around funding for, for charities actually going into um 
our you know us thinking through how we were going to manage that and what we needed to do to remain financially sustainable protecting our frontline um, debt advisor roles was really important to us it was a really key priority and so we were actually not able to not make any compulsory redundancies from our um, frontline debt advisors uh, roles um, which we were really pleased to be able to um, help safeguard our service like that um, but it does show you that the need for more funding you know we're not the only debt advisor organization that's um been finding um funding for our service difficult i think you've spoken on previous episodes about uh, this issue within the sector and i think it just does highlight the need that this issue isn't done and we still need to be talking about it and looking for a solution because debt advice is really needed at this time we know that there's nine million people over indebted in the uk and um would really benefit from advice and we need to make sure that is there for people to explore the wider aspect of funding where do advice sector get its funding from um, so there's quite a range of different ways that advice is funded um, and different types of organisations. So some like ourselves, actually, the majority of our funding is, is is independent. It's from individuals and our church partners that um, donate monthly to support what we're doing. Um, lots of debt advice in the UK is funded by the Money and Pension Service, um, mainly from a levy from uh, on financial services firms. Um, local authorities are a, funding, a funder of debt advice. Um, and there's also something called Fair Share, um, which is where um, creditors agree to pay back a percentage of the repayments they receive as part of debt management plans to help fund the debt advice services that have helped their customers. Um, and so all of those different funding models allow us free debt advice to be offered. There are also some um, organisations that will charge a fee to clients um, to provide them with debt advice and solutions and um, so that's a different part of the sort of debt advice market if you will um, and similar to that as well there is um, providers who provide particularly um, IVAs um, where there are fees involved in that solution as there well. Fees. As you know um, FCA has now um, published its ban of debt referral fees what is your take on this? Yeah, so I mean, for us, referral fees are, not, are by no means a substantial income stream for us. They're much more um, part of the IVA market. Um, I think we think it's a really positive move. There's there's quite a lot of concern about the mis-selling of um, IVAs. And part of that picture is that there are these um, debt packager firms that source potential new clients and receive a referral fee for passing them on to um, an IVA providing firm. And so we think it's, it's one part of the puzzle. And I think it's a really positive move from the FCA, something that was in their gift and power. Um, but we are also keen to see um, more changes made in actually how IVAs um, provision is regulated, which is handled by um, the insolvency service primarily. Um, and so we're still looking in that direction as well. Thank you, Rachel. Um, let me get Amy Taylor into the conversation. Um, Amy, you are at the front line of the conversation when it comes to delivery advice. You've heard what both have to say. What is the initial initial thoughts on what they have said so far? That's very interesting. Um, I, I was quite interested in what Helen was saying about the um, the welfare state, you know, and the history of it, which is quite quite interesting in itself. And I, I think. William Beveridge would be spinning in his grave at the moment because the, the safety net just isn't there, you know. So so I, I agree with that. I agree with the point that Helen made about PIP applications being incredibly difficult for people who are already struggling, you know. So they're, they're probably the least likely to be able to do a PIP application without some kind of um, help. And it's made more difficult for them. So... So that and, you know, 13 years of austerity hasn't helped the situation. Uh, I also, you know, agree um, with what Rachel was saying about the funding of debt advice and that shrunk, you know, over the, over the same period probably, you know. So the need has shot up and the supply has reduced. You do a, a, a you know, blog about debt advice and the clients that you see. What is your take on the ban on debt referral fees i think it's a start uh, i think it's half a job though um so there's, there's plenty of unregulated firms out there that are still going to be um avoiding this ban um and the the firms that are affected by it have now four months to try and find a loophole i don't really understand why they do you know we 
they could have given them two months, for instance. Um, so I don't think it's going to eliminate bad practice. I think it's a good start, but I think more needs to be done, not just with IBAs, but with the entire insolvency framework, which is something that the insolvency service is looking at. Um, and, you know, I'd love them to hurry up and tell us what they're going to do. No doubt every data has a story to tell. And from your direct experience of what it means to be, I suppose, unsustainable budget or uh, Rachel's um, other term, um, deficit budget, what does it mean for you on a day-to-day -day basis when you see a client with deficit budget? Well, for me, it essentially means we're, we're going to be talking about priority debts uh, and essential household bills rather than looking at loans and credit cards, for instance. So for me, an unsustainable budget typically um, is where... You are also dealing with traumatic situations. Uh, Rachel mentioned about uh, clients who are thinking suicidal thoughts. Uh, when you get to that situation, what is the dynamics between the advisor and the client? It's a supportive one um, with, with the name to be empowering. So we're there as an advisor to share whatever expert knowledge and experience we have to help our clients find a way to get back in control. Um, so you do this by not judging them, you know, but by empathizing and trying to understand what they want to achieve. And then you, you help them to do that, you know, in any way that you can. And if people are traumatized by an event in their lives, well, that's usually perfectly understandable. And um, sometimes the job is just to listen, you know, um, because that way we can build a picture of uh, where the client is or has been and, and where they want to get to and what we can possibly do to help them so it is common like like Rachel said you know that debt becomes so overpowering and worrying that you know people start to think they can't see a way out of it and I just say there usually is a way you know and it starts with that conversation and there's usually something we can find e even if it doesn't solve the whole thing, it will improve the situation. So trauma is part and parcel of life, isn't it? And, and it does come up quite a lot in debt advice. So we just, we just accept it and try and be supportive. You have been in the debt advice sector for many years, and I don't want to name the number of years you've been in the sector, but what changes have you noticed within the sector both for clients and both for advisors? Uh, I think all debt advisors who've been around for an unmentionable number of years, let's say, would say that we've felt the impact of austerity and the loss of legal aid funding. Um, so we lost a lot of debt advisors that way because simply the, the funding has dried up and people have had to go off and do something else. Um, so it's it's got more difficult Certainly with the change from legal, advice, legal aid funding to the money and pension service model has meant it's become much more bureaucratic. I don't know if enjoyable is the right word for debt advice, really, but it's become constricted by too much quality checking and form filling and box ticking, you know, that kind of thing. So it's, um, it's not in a great place. At the moment, I would say there's a lot of funding issues right across the board. Um, and I, one thing that really does bother me about debt advice is that it's it's not available everywhere. Actually, you know, the, if I could change one thing, it would be that local authorities have to provide it um, like any other statutory service. I know, you know, funding 
government hasn't got enough money and all the rest of it. But it's a postcode lottery at the moment and people should be able within their locality to access good free uh, local advice, you know, if they need it. I'd heard about a study, I think it was um, in Canada uh, a few years ago, where instead of sort of food bank vouchers and the usual stuff, they, they gave, I think it was seven and a half thousand Canadian dollars or something to a certain number of people just to see what would happen. And it turned out, you know, that, and then this is not the only place I think, I think it's been done in, in many different countries. I think that generally people are happier you know um, which is not surprising but then are paying back into the system so you know being able to afford food your bills and everything else sort of helps your mental health you're then able to perhaps spend money back in the economy you know uh, maybe you're not needing to use the NHS as much or because you know your mental health has improved by it so I wonder if it could pay itself back given enough time, you know. Um, but I think what I would say is that I'll just watch these two pilot areas, you know, with close interest really to see what happens. I'll be coming back to my panellists to get top tips from them on this precise episode. For those who are listening to Debt Talk um, podcast and want to share your experience or you want to hear specific subjects, you can get in touch with me, ripon.ray at yourdoctordebt.com or at yourdoctordebt on Twitter. So speaking of top tips, let me get back to my panellists and ask them for the tips. Let me start with Helen. So I would say the first thing is that, so one of the things you hear a lot from people who come to food banks is how, what a difficult thing it is to do, how ashamed and embarrassed people feel that they have ended up in that situation, even though when they get there, it's, there's a warm welcome and so on. Um, and we know that an enormous number of people who are going without essentials don't reach out for help because of that fear and that embarrassment and that shame. So I think the main thing I would say is that if you're somebody who is really struggling, there are millions of people exactly like you and there is help out there. So, for instance, there is uh, we run with a citizen's advice, a helpline called Help Through Hard for Hardship, where you can call up and just talk through whatever financial issues or other issues you're facing. And they can give you benefits advice. They can put you on to debt advice and so on. But I think the main thing I would say is there are both national and local charities, community groups who are there. Many of the people there have themselves been through incredible hardship. They know exactly what it's like. Um, so mainly ask for help as early as you feel able to, because the earlier you get the help, the less things mount up. And Rachel. I think uh, another thing that's really helpful is to make sure that um, you're getting as much income as you possibly can and saving as much as you possibly can on the expenses because every little really does help, doesn't it? And um, we have a benefits calculator on the Christians Against Poverty website, which um, we have in partnership with Turn to Us, which is a really easy way to check that you're not missing out on any things like council tax support um, or universal credit we've had lots of people finding hundreds of pounds actually of income a month who just didn't realize that they would be eligible at all so it's worth checking and I think in particular two things that often people don't realize are available are social tariffs um, for water and also for broadband for um, low-income households there are different eligibility criteria for the different companies but it's worth checking with um, your company or potentially other providers for broadband and um, to see what you might be able to get at a much lower rate than you're currently paying and finally amy taylor our debt advisor of the month am i <laughs> now you are <laughs> okay um my main tip is do not get debt advice off social media whether it's tiktok instagram facebook or whatever else there are some exceptions to this debt camel on instagram is one she gives really good information out but in general, go to your local citizens advice, go to your local council, Christians Against Poverty, whatever it is. Don't get debt advice off social media. 
Well, I want to thank my panelists for giving their precious time to speak on Deadpool podcast. Um, in my next episode, uh, I'll cover another pressing topic, which is already haunting us all, artificial intelligence and the debt sector. You've been listening to Deadpool podcast with me as your host, Ripon Ray.